About 50 years ago, an astronaut returning from the moon experienced things that he couldn't find a scientific explanation for. So, with some colleagues, he launched a new science focused on the mind and how it works in the body and across space and time. It's the field of noetics, where the tools of modern science are used to help us understand how what we think and feel affects us and the world around us. Now, this is Dr. Ruth Miller's Noetic Moments from the studios of KXCR Community Radio in Florence, Oregon. And this is Noetic Moments, where we explore the field of research that discovers what consciousness is, what it does, how it works, and how our lives could be very different if we understood it better. I'm Ruth Miller, a longtime student of consciousness, cybernetics, and anthropology, and through this series of programs, I'm introducing some of the people whose work has defined this field of research, and I'm explaining some of their ideas and experiments. I'll also explore some relevant news items and answer questions that you send to my email address, ruth at noeticmoments.org. Now, most of you know in the world of medicine and psychology, consciousness is defined as being awake, aware, knowing what's going on around us. In the field of noetics, though, consciousness is much more. Beyond the processes and products of mind, both in our awareness and outside of it, and those profound human experiences that shape our lives, consciousness ultimately is what connects us all. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, There is one mind common to all humanity, and each of us is an inlet and outlet to the same. In this series, so far, We've looked at a number of models of what consciousness is and how it works. We started with Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung a hundred years ago in the early 20th century, who were among the first to look scientifically at what goes on in the mind, and who were quite clear that most of what goes on in the mind is not in our normal awareness. It is, in fact, unconscious. Then we walked through Charles Tart's descriptions of the various states of consciousness so that we could see that normal awareness is just one of the many states in which we are functioning. Julian Jaynes related states of consciousness and our experience of consciousness of being awake and aware to the separation of right and left hemispheres in our brain. And we looked at how the right hemisphere tends to be aware of some things and the left brain, the left hemisphere of the brain, tends to be aware of other things. Then we looked at some of the field models of mind that have been developed to explain how it is that mind affects and is affected by the body and other things faster than nerve signals can travel. Kurt Levine's field theory was some of the earliest, and Rupert Sheldrake is some of the most recent to help us understand that. And then we looked at that larger brain idea, that larger field beyond the individual, the global brain, as Peter Russell called it, or the nuosphere, as Teilhard de Chardin talked about it, or the global mind that Irvin Laszlo talks about which then relates to, of course, quantum mechanics. What is field and what is particle and what state is anything in and how consciousness can be described in those terms by folks like David Bohm, Dana Zohar, and Omit Goswami. That brought up the whole field of transpersonal psychology, applying some of these understandings in therapy as well as research. It also brought up the realization that there is a connection between mind, brain, and body, and Candace Pert's studies with what she called molecules of emotion emitted by the brain and affecting the whole body, and Bruce Lipton, who pointed out that the way the cells respond to the chemicals lead to the idea of a biology that's based on the chemicals that are released, which are a function of our belief. So a biology of belief. So we learned that it's possible to achieve a state of coherence in which the mind, the emotions, and the body are in alignment. 
That led to exploring some of the experiments that came up. And we looked at demonstrations of telepathic communication between two people, experiments involving mind affecting matter, and the experience of remote viewing or clairvoyance. We realized that that state of coherence and other states of consciousness define our ability to achieve some of the results in those experiments, which then brought up the idea of frequencies, how we can move into higher and lower frequencies of vibration pattern in the brain and the heart. Penny Pierce's work, the study of cymatics, the water crystal experiments, Masaru Emoto and others helped us understand that. For several episodes, we looked at the healing process, the role that consciousness and these energy frequencies play in the body's response to threats and distress, which we will be looking more at after we complete the series we're in right now, which has to do with the brain, which is the bridge between the mind, that field, and the body, these particles, and which materialist scientists think somehow is the origin of our consciousness. You can catch up on these past shows on the kxcr.net archives. Click on the little cloud up on the banner at the top of the screen, and on our website, www.noeticmoments.org, where you'll also find links to the clips, the books, and the authors that I mention on the show. Now, this question of how that field state of consciousness or mind and the particle state of the brain and the neurons, and it's a particularly hard problem for materialist scientists that are looking at a lump of meat and trying to figure out how creativity and beauty and joy can come out of that, right? How do cells produce self-awareness and the senses that we experience? This is the hard problem. Now, the most effective explanation that has been out now is that there is a quantum level process in the brain occurring within the neurons that matches the quantum field of consciousness. It's interesting to realize that the earliest, earliest models of consciousness were based on the advanced technology of that time. They were flow models like irrigation systems. Later models were based on the advanced technology of their time, machine models like steam engines and geared mechanisms. Then as we moved into the digital age, the leading edge explanations were having to do with computer analogies, that we have nerves that are functioning like the on-off switches that make up a computer with their zeros and ones. Now we're beginning to experience the power of quantum computing, and we're starting to see quantum understandings of the mind and brain. Fascinating, isn't it? Well, this new understanding is in large part the work of the Nobel Prize winning physicist Roger Penrose from England and is an addition to Stuart Hameroff, an anesthesiologist who has been working with a structural understanding of what goes on in the brain. Roger Penrose is one of the leading theorists in quantum thinking. And he's very interested in how it is that the wave form of something collapses into the particle form. And we talked briefly about this way back when we were doing quantum models of the brain or quantum mechanics affecting the brain. And what we're looking at is a model that says that when the scientist establishes an experiment, then there are an infinite possible outcomes. And that infinity collapses into one particular outcome. How does that happen? Penrose has a number of ideas. You can go online and listen to him at um, all kinds of YouTubes. And what he says is what's happening is there's a way in which the potentials 
are objectively reduced, structured by the structure in which it is happening. So if it's happening in a physics experiment, like the famous double slit experiment, where a series of single electrons or photons or even ions can be fired at a screen and show up as either wave or particle, depending on whether an observer is present, or it can be the structure of what Stuart Hameroff has found, microtubules inside the neuron cells. Again, you can find a lot of YouTubes where Stuart is explaining his model, and there are some other ways to find what he has to say. The idea is that the structure of a cell is not a bunch of things floating around inside a membrane, but that there are these tiny, tiny atom-sized tubules between all the pieces creating a lattice and connecting them, and that those connections are working at the level of subatomic particles because they are so small, and that because they're operating at that level, they are actually quantum processes at body temperatures in the cells. I'll let Stuart explain it in this YouTube. I got an interest in consciousness as an undergrad and uh, then in med school was oriented towards uh, neurology, psychiatry, neuroscience, uh, uh, neurosurgery. Um, but I didn't, uh, the lifestyles didn't grab me. And I, I did a, a research elective in a cancer lab studying mitosis, how cells divide and, and the chromosomes are pulled apart by these uh, spindles called microtubules, which are microtubules and centrioles. And at that same time, in the early 70s, um, a couple other things happened. Uh, it was discovered that microtubules were in all cells because prior to that, the fixative agent for the electron mi microscope was dissolving them. And the inside of cells looked like a watery soup. But then when they changed, uh, I think, from osmium tetroxide to glutaraldehyde or something like that, all of a sudden they saw all this structure inside cells, including neurons. So neurons were full of these microtubules and cytoskeletal structures, which had a, a grid-like uh, lattice, which reminded me of a computer because the early 70s was, for me, also the beginning of the computer era. And I was trying to you know, learn and figure them out about Boolean switching matrices. And it all came down to some kind of switching matrix and interactions. And of course, synapses in the brain were thought to be that. But I thought microtubules might be processing information at this basic level. And I got that idea that they were computers, and I worked on that for 20 years, going into anesthesia, studying how anesthesia worked, uh, saying there was all this information processing at a deeper level. And then one day after 20 years, somebody said, okay, let's say you're right. How would that explain consciousness? How would that explain feelings, love, joy, so-called heart problem, which came along later? And I had to admit they were they were right. I, I really didn't know. I... Uh, and they suggested I read a book by Roger Penrose called The Emperor's New Mind, which had a mechanism but needed a structure. So I did. And uh, here we are another uh, 30 years later. Wow. Well, I should say that, that what happened was that he and I teamed up and we developed a, a theory of quantum computations in microtubules inside neurons of the brain, which uh, underlie uh, brain activity. And uh, this was a controversial, controversial idea for a lot of reasons. People thought Biology is too warm, wet, and noisy for uh, delicate quantum effects. Um, but that turned out not to be the case. Um, plants use quantum coherence and photosynthesis. I'm looking out at beautiful the mountains uh, and the and trees and plants, and and they're all using photosynthesis uh, to uh, to uh, take sunlight and convert it to chemical energy via a process that goes through a protein where the energy gets. Uh, uh, converted to uh, uh, coherent excitons, quantum uh, property, quantum particles or entities that go through seven different uh, 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 chromophores in superposition at the same time. And that quantum efficiency allows the sunlight to be converted to chemical energy that we eat and the, and the animals eat and so forth. So without that, there may not, may not be light and uh, may not be life nor consciousness. And uh, so if a plant can, can do it, I figure uh, the brain can do it. So it turns out the brain can do it. Microtubules are really good at quantum coherence. So what Hameroff and Penrose have managed to do and appear to be doing quite successfully based on the kinds of experimental results they're getting 
is to look at the structure of the cell as a place where what has been an infinite field can become a biological signal which then can be transmitted through the body to generate the sensation of different states of consciousness and different states of what we call emotions or feelings, as well as physical conditions. So it's a very powerful theory, and as I say, it's being tested pretty effectively. Now, Stuart has some more to say about this, and I'm going to let him do so. The quantum activity appears random, but we don't really know. And in the collapse, in, in Roger's view of objective reduction, there's something he calls a non-computable effect. That uh, if it, maybe it's random, but then when the collapse occurs, there's some kind of a bias or tilt towards certain values, so certain perceptions, certain actions that he used to call platonic values. That could be, you know, uh, the way of the Tao or divine guidance or something in a spiritual realm, but. He kind of shies away from that, but uh, it's actually the uh, the Schrodinger-Newton equation in his in his formulas, and uh, so those are two pretty good names to drop if you're going right. to have an equation. Yes. So, but but there's some some sense that there may be platonic values that the collapse occurs to. Whether it's random before the collapse is another question. But a quantum computation, you have multiple coexisting possibilities in quantum superposition, and then you're right when collapse occurs or something happens, they pick definite ones and Many people think, thought, and still think that consciousness comes from the outside and causes collapse. Roger turned that around and said collapse occurs spontaneously and causes consciousness. Collapse occurs spontaneously and causes consciousness. And in this case, they're using the word consciousness as awareness, as self-awareness. So we're on the edge, perhaps, of having a mechanism by which mind can be an infinite field and mind can be directly impacting, directly connected with what is going on in the brain. Very powerful theory, and I have a feeling we're going to hear a lot more about Dr. Stuart Hammeroff and Sir Roger Penrose. So much for that interesting stuff. We're getting closer and closer. I thought we would look at another very technical thing today. This is a book called The Tree of Knowledge, The Biological Roots of Human Understanding. Now, it's written by two people that I knew about as relatively young at that time, biologists in Chile. They were working with some cyberneticians who were brought down to Chile by Allende to help design an economic system that could work prior to the overthrow of the Allende administration. These cyberneticians were helping them to see the connectedness of things. Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela were looking at the relationship between biology and understanding. So The Tree of Knowledge, The Biological Roots of Human Understanding. It's a pretty technical book. It's in the New Science Library of Shambhala Press. The back of the cover says, The science of biology today is witnessing a revolution comparable to the one undergone by physics earlier in the century. That's the last century. At the forefront of this revolution are Professors Maturana and Varela, who present in this book a radical view of the life processes by which human beings attain knowledge of the world around them. And that is what this is about. The book came out in 1988, so it's by no means new, but you'd never know that based on what's going on in the world around us, yeah? The chapter headings are kind of cool, knowing how we know, the organization of living things, history, reproduction, and heredity, the life of metacellulars, that's people and other forms of life that form systems beyond their individual beings and beyond the cellular form even, like organizations and companies and villages. Chapter 5 is The Natural Drift of Living Beings, Behavioral Domains. This is so important in their work, the idea of domains, that there are domains of our life that 
have to do with the behaviors of, for example, language, the linguistic domain. It doesn't just include language. It is the domain in which language can occur. Then they talk about the nervous system and cognition, which is part of what we've been talking about today, social phenomena, how it is that social things happen, and then we have the linguistic domains, and human consciousness, and ultimately the tree of knowledge. Now, one of the points that they're making in the 1980s is that the neural structure is plastic. They're saying, in fact, the structural change, I'm on 167. Now, the structural change of the nervous system does not normally occur as something radical in its broad lines of connectivity. These, on the whole, are invariant, and generally they are the same in all individuals in one species, which is to say the connection between the brain and the foot is probably not going to be very radically changed, although there might be other things. So the changes occur not in the connections that unite groups of neurons, but in the local characteristics of those connections. They occur in the final ramifications and the synapses. Their molecular changes can modify drastically how the entire network functions. And one of the things that they say on the next page, the plasticity of the nervous system lies in the fact that the neurons are not connected as though they were cables with their respective plugs. The points of interaction between the cells are zones of delicate dynamic balance modulated by a great number of elements that trigger local structural changes and that are produced as a result of the activity of those cells and of other cells whose products are released into the blood flow and wash the neurons. A couple of pages later, 170, from the observer's standpoint, Changes are seen as learning. What is occurring, however, is that the neurons, the organism they integrate, and the environment in which they interact operate reciprocally as selectors of their corresponding structural changes and are coupled with each other structurally. They're pointing out that no cells in the body and no individual is making choices or are making choices isolated from the environment in which they're working, that it's a mutually reciprocal overlapping balance. So that's part of, a very small part, of the Tree of Knowledge by Maturana and Varela, who, by the way, are the inventors of a term you may have heard, autopoesis. Autopoesis, an autopoetic system, is one that creates itself. In my schema, when we talked about cybernetics last time, I was telling you about a single loop cybernetic system like a thermostat, or a multiple loop cybernetic system like a body or an organism. And then Francisco Barella and Umberto Maturana invented the idea of a self creating system which is what we are doing all the time, creating ourselves. And in another episode, we'll talk about the next level, what I call fourth-order cybernetics. Well, that sound tells us it's time to be shifting gears. If you've just joined us, you are listening to Noetic Moments on KXCR 90.7 FM and streaming on kxcr.net. I am Ruth Miller, and this segment of our show is when we look at what you have asked us to look at or what the news is telling us. And the news is telling us that there is a lot going on in the collective consciousness of the planet and of this country, the United States in particular. The collective consciousness is dealing with dividedness, is dealing with polarity, is dealing with what seems to be not good and seems to be good. And everyone seems to have a different perspective on what that is, eh? 
So can we begin to consider the possibility that consciousness is a field that is affecting all of us and all of us are affecting the field? If that's the case, then we want to be aware that when we observe in the world around us a particular issue, particularly something like the polarity and the polarization of today's culture, then maybe we might want to look inside and see how that is playing out in our inner life as well as our outer world. And that, in fact, is the essence of the teaching of the various metaphysical philosophers of the 19th century and before. If you want to know what's going on outside, look within. And if you want to know what's going on inside, look without. As without, so within. That's the essence. So I invite you over the next few weeks as the world continues to unravel in many ways and come together in many new ways to take a look at what's going on inside whenever you are hooked by what might be happening in the world around you. You also might consider getting off the media and not watching quite so much of the entertainment and the drama that has become what we have called news in the past. So there's lots of possibilities here. This is an amazing time to be living in, and our consciousness is part of what we are going to experience more of in the future. Well, that's it for today's show. The next time we get together, we'll look at more of the research that's being done in an attempt to understand what consciousness is, what it really does, and how we can experience life differently when we use it fully. We are out of time for today. But remember, you can continue the exploration on our website, www.noeticmoments.org, where there is a list of archived past shows along with the titles and other resources we refer to on each show, and where you can send me your comments and questions, and I'll do my best to get them answered the next time we're on the air. For now, thanks for joining me here on Noetic Moments at KXCR Community Radio, 90.7 FM in Florence, Oregon. Have a wonderful week. You've been listening to Dr. Ruth Miller's Noetic Moments. This program is produced in the studios of KXCR Community Radio in beautiful Florence, Oregon, supported by you, our listeners. Our theme music is Tumbling Planets, composed and performed by Jeff Lovejoy. To hear this program again or learn more about Noetic Sciences, search our website, www.noeticmoments.org.